Good afternoon and welcome to the subcommittee on planning dispositions and concessions. I am council member Ben Kalos, the chair of this subcommittee. You can tweet me at Ben Kalos and find me there on Gram and Facebook, even GitHub. Today we're joined by uh, council member Ruben Diaz Sr., council member Chaim Deutsch, and a guest at our committee because it is the best committee, uh, council member Carlina Rivera. Today we'll be holding a hearing on four projects, land use items uh, 357 for 332 Eldert Street, land use item 358 for 63 Stockholm Street, land use item 347 Cooper Square MHA Phase 1, and pre-considered land use item 187 for West 133rd Street. If you are here to testify, please fill out a white witness uh, speaker slip with the sergeant at arms and indicate the project name of the item you wish to testify on on that slip. Before we begin our hearings, we will be voting to approve three projects we heard in February. Uh, land use item 330, 67-69 St. Nicholas Avenue, land use 342, 32-34 Putnam Avenue cluster, and land use items 30, 343, 344, and 345 East Village Homes Phase 1 and 2, and East Village Homes NCP. For land use item 330, 67-69 St. Nicholas Avenue in Councilmember Perkins District in Manhattan, HPD is seeking a 40-year Article 11 tax exemption pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law and the termination of the prior exemption for this site. The building, a 27-unit low-income co-op, was carved out of the most recent round of third-party transfer program. Yay! The 40-year tax exemption will be retroactive for 10 years and forward for 30 years. The current HDFC will retain ownership of the building. That is great news. Councilmember Perkins is supportive of this project, as am I. Uh, for pre-considered land use 32-34, Putnam Avenue cluster, which consists of a group of buildings in the districts of Majority Leader Cumbo and Councilmember Cornegay in Brooklyn, the project includes six partially occupied city-owned buildings that will provide 51 affordable cooperative dwelling units, five affordable rental dwelling units, and four storefront commercial spaces, which are restricted on the rent for affordable commercial space. HPD is seeking pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and Section 577 of Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law approval of an urban development action project and real property tax exemption for these properties located at 32 Putnam Avenue, 34 Putnam Avenue, 550 DeKalb Albion, 55 Carlton Avenue, 374-76 Prospects Place, and 1216 Pacific Street. Majority Leader Cumbo and Council Member Cornegie are both supportive of this project and saving the best, perhaps for last, land use items 343, 344, 30, 345, East Village Homes Phase 1 and 2, and East Village Homes NCP will facilitate the new construction of two mixed-use, mixed-income residential rental buildings with 54 units in total that will be built on two non-contiguous vacant city-owned lots. Phase 1 of the project is located at 302 East 2nd Street. Phase 2 is located at 276 East 3rd Street in Manhattan. HPD is seeking an Article 11 tax exemptions from the two sites, an amendment to previous approved UDAP project. The original UDAP project was approved by New York City Council in April 29th, 2010. Ooh. That's because it took nine years to get done. Resolution number 214 in July and July 19, 2006, 2006, under resolution number 450, Council Member Rivera is supportive of this project and is here to say some words on it. Great. Thank you. 2010 was a good year, though. So, Chair Kalos and committee members, thank you for the time to, to comment on the application today. I, I want to briefly state my support for, of course, uh, Cooper Square Mutual Housing and the project that you will be discussing today. I cannot stay for it, but they know they have my full support, and I look forward to working with HPD on this project. Thank you for the opportunity to once again speak in support of an affordable housing development in my district. East Village Homes is sited at two vacant city-owned lots on East 2nd and East 3rd Streets. After previous attempts at developing these parcels some years ago, I believe the Department of Housing Preservation and Development has negotiated a development plan that will finally yield results. The development team is led by Asian Americans for Equality, AFI, a local nonprofit with a successful track record in not-for-profit housing provision. Over the last two years, they have diligently worked on obtaining the public financing and city capital to bring this project to fruition. I was happy to commit capital for my own allotment to make truly affordable units a reality in my district. The actions before you will result in 53 units with affordability for 40 years and will include commercial and community facility space. 
The unit mix is targeted to both individuals and families, and units will run as low as 27% of AMI. This is a sorely needed housing asset in a neighborhood that continues to see immense rental pressure. I thank HPD for working quickly on this latest phase of the disposition, as well as the development team at AFI for their continued efforts at expanding affordable housing opportunities in the Lower East Side. I ask this committee to support this project and vote to approve these actions today. Thank you so much. I now call for a vote to approve land use items 330, 342, 343, 344, and 345. Council, please call the roll. Chair Kalos. Aye. Uh, Councilmember Deutsch. Aye. Councilmember Diaz. Aye. Uh, the land use items that are approved by a vote of three in the affirmative, no negatives, no abstentions, and will be referred to the land use committee for a vote, and we will leave this vote open. Our, uh, we've been joined by uh, Council Member Antonio Reynoso, whose uh, item is, he is perfectly on time for the item that is upcoming. Our first hearing will be on two projects which we will hear together, Land Use Item 357, 332 Elder Street in Council Member Espinal's district, and Land Use Item 358, 63 Stockholm Street, Council Member Reynoso's district, both in Brooklyn. A third party, privately owned site at 272 Jefferson Street is also part of the project, but is not seeking any City Council approvals. Land use items 357, 332 Elder Street will facilitate the development of a new building with four units of affordable housing. Land use item 358, 30, 63 Stockholm Street will facilitate the development of a new building with 20 units of affordable housing. Both projects will be developed in vacant city owned lots, will serve a range of incomes from 30% to 80% of AMI and include a 10% set aside for formerly homeless. These, I, I just want to note that these are very low AMIs, and I want to compliment uh, the local council member, uh, Antonio Reynoso, on really achieving such deep levels of affordability. HPD, this project will receive an as of right 420C tax exemption. HPD seeks approval for an urban development action area designation for land use 358 and for land use 357. Uh, seeks project, seek project and disposition approval for block 3419, lot 24, and block 3243, lot 65. I now open the public hearing on land use items 357, 358, 330, for 332 Elder to Street and 63 Stockholm Street. And before we hear HPD's testimony, I'd like to invite Council Member Antonio Reynoso, uh, former co-chair of the Progressive Caucus, my friend and colleague, to provide uh, some remarks. Thank you, Chair Cato's. I uh, appreciate the time. I uh, just want to actually uh, let the HPD know um, and uh, the committee know of how supportive I am of this project. Uh, the affordable housing issues that we're having in our district are, um, are something that we don't feel we can get a grasp on, actually, um, considering the amount of gentrification and displacement that is happening throughout the city, but mostly in Winnersburg and Bushwick in my district. Um, so this is going to be a, a, welcome, a welcome asset to the community. Uh, it is 20 units of all affordable housing. Uh, the affordability, actually, I don't want to take credit for any of it. Um, it falls in line with the uh, mission statement of Rise Borough and St. Nick's Alliance to uh, build affordable housing for the neediest and for the demographic that suits our community. So um, I didn't need to do any pushing for them to actually uh, ask for this. They, they've, they've actually done it on their own. Um, so it's no surprise to me that the uh, affordability level is extremely, extremely low. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing more details on the project, but happy that um, HPD has uh, allowed for this lot to be developed by affordable housing providers in the district without the need of private developers. Um, and uh, I think we're finally going to, uh, hopefully we can use this as a model and an example and do all of the housing available in our district through city-owned land that all can all be developed in the near future. Um, 60 Stockholm has been in the district uh, 
for a long time, and HPD is yet to move on it. So the fact that we're moving on it is a good thing, but it's taking a long time. And I feel like there's other properties in our district that are ripe for development that have been sitting um, while the city is um, uh, going through an affordability crisis. So it just it's just beyond me why we can't get this all done in an expedited timeline. Uh, but again, want to thank HPD for being here and the chair for allowing me an opportunity to speak. We will probably hear in the testimony, but you recall how long that piece of land has been sitting there vacant? Yeah, um, I don't know exactly the timeline, but uh, I'm uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, the lot is probably a part of um, a, a UDAP, uh, which is probably done in the 1980s. So worst case scenario, this probably has been sitting vacant for more than 40 years in this community, a wow. community that is suffering from affordable housing or the need of affordable housing and gentrification. Thank you. Uh, we will now ask the uh, panel to state your names for the record. If somebody is planning to do a presentation, they should go sit at the table as well. Uh, if you can please state your names for the record. Lacey Tauber, HPD. Drew Vanderberg, Riseboro Community Partnership. And then we'll ask the committee council to administer the oath and or affirmation. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So um, I have two testimonies, one for each site. They are a little bit repetitive, so sorry about that. But um, there's two different actions, so we need to read them both into the record. Um, <clears throat> land use item number 357 consists of the proposed disposition of one city-owned vacant lot at 332 Elder Street in the Bushwick section of Brooklyn, Council District 37, known as Bushwick Alliance 332 Elder Street. The sponsor for the project was selected through a competitive process and proposes to develop the site under Sorry. HPD's... Sorry to interrupt Sorry, no your problem. testimony. Mm -hmm. Give me one moment. I'd like to acknowledge Absolutely. that we've been joined by Councilmember Vanessa Gibson. I just want to reopen uh, the vote. Committee Council. Uh, vote on land use items 330, 342, 343, 344, and 345. Councilmember Gibson. I vote aye. The land use items are approved by a vote of four in the affirmative, no negatives, no abstentions, and will be referred to the full land use committee for a vote. Thank you. Please continue. Okay, Thank you. Um, the sponsor for the project was selected through a competitive process and proposes to develop the site under HPD's Neighborhood Construction Program, or NCP. The NCP funds the new construction of infill rental housing on small but developable sites. The Elder Street site is a component of a larger project known as Bushwick Alliance NCP. Upon completion, the building will contribute four units of rental housing that will be affordable to low-income individuals and households with incomes up to 80% of AMI. The unit mix comprises one one-bedroom and three two-bedroom apartments with rents targeted at tiers of 37%, 47%, and 77% of AMI. Additionally, under a separate land use action, the Bushwick Alliance project will include a second city-owned site <coughs> and a private site that will provide 24 additional units for a total of 28 housing units. The estimated total development cost for the Bushwick Alliance project is $14,594,898, which is subject to change. In order to facilitate construction of this project, HPD is before the council seeking approval of land use item number 357. Okay, and then land use item number 358 consists of a ULERP action seeking UDAP area designation and project disposition and approval for one vacant city-owned lot at 63 Stockholm Street in the Bushwick section of Brooklyn, Council District 34, known as Bushwick Alliance 63 Stockholm Street. The sponsor for the project was selected through a competitive process and proposes to develop the site under HPD's Neighborhood Construction Program. Um, I'll skip some things I already said. A component of the larger project known as Bushwick Alliance NCP, the proposed development at 63 Stockholm Street will result in new construction of a four-story building with 20 units of rental housing that will be affordable to low-income individuals and households with incomes up to 80% of AMI. The unit mixer comprises of five studios, eight one-bedroom and seven two-bedroom apartments with rents targeted at tiers of 27%, 37%, 47%, and 77% of AMI. Amenities for tenants will include laundry facilities, storage spaces for general use and bicycles, and a planted recreational yard. The building will be built to enterprise green community standards to conserve energy and reduce environmental impacts. Um, and then I think the rest of it is just what you've already heard about the project as a whole. So I will skip that part and submit this, if that's OK, um, for the record. And I would just want to add a comment. Um, 
about, and I want to say thank you for your support of this project, Council Member. And I think uh, the thing about your comment on these uh, vacant lots, the NCP and NIHOP program that is designed to address that concern, that exact concern, is still fairly new. And we're starting to see a lot of projects in that pipeline now where we're able to use those, pro those programs to develop um, affordable housing on some of these smaller and harder to develop lots that have been sitting for a long time. And so that's exactly you know, what this program is meant to address. Can I ask a question? Uh, also, uh, given that it's a new program, I think one of the parts where, um, that we actually are happy about is the fact that most of these pro projects are going to exclusively to community-based organizations. Uh, there was a time before the Bloomberg administration where uh, building by non-for-profits was the norm, and um, overnight it just became that they can't develop anymore. They don't know how to develop, or they don't have the capacity to develop. Prior to then, it was almost exclusively done by public uh, by non-for-profits. Uh, maybe this is the beginning of us restarting that conversation, but even now we see HPD um, seeing that uh, or believing that they have to have joint public-private partnerships or exclusively private partnerships to build affordable housing in the city, and I disagree with that. I would challenge anyone to, to speak to Riseboro or St. Nick's ability to build affordable housing, even at large scale, without any private partnership. So if this is the beginning of reopening that conversation and, uh, and a movement by HPD into building, again, allowing for the right people to build this affordable housing, then I'm extremely excited for it. And I'm excited to see this program continue to do its work because you're right, I'm very happy that we're finally figuring this out and there's some initiative done here by um, HPD to build these smaller lots that have been gone vacant for quite some time. Let's go to the presentation from Riceboro. Hello, thank you for having me here today. I'm just going to speak briefly on the project, happy to answer any questions, let you know the details. Um, so this project is one ULERP and also one UDAP as was discussed earlier. Um, two items, um, and this is also two nonprofit developers based in the community who will both be um, developing and owning these uh, buildings. And I just want to point out it's a scattered site cluster, obviously two vacant owned sites and one private site, and that is three new buildings which will be property managed by Riseboro. We have buildings all over this neighborhood, so um, we're excited to add these three to our scattered site portfolio. Um, and it's a total of 28 new affordable apartments um, in Bushwick. So here is the uh, technical language about what we are requesting today, the Urban Development Action Area Project Designation and Project Approval. You can skip that, go to the next one. All right. Everyone else has done it. You got it. <laughs> um, this is just a bird's eye view of the site, uh, bounded by Evergreen Avenue, Central Avenue, DeKalb Avenue, and Stockholm Street. And then um, here we have the details about the building. So this is, when we get to the good stuff. 20 units, four stories, 27% uh, AMI to 80% AMI. Um, and this building will be designed to passive house standards, which Riseboro and St. Nick's are really excited about, a type of architecture uh, and construction methodology I'll get into at a later slide. There will be solar panels. There will be a laundry room. There will be bicycle storage, a backyard, it's going to be about 19,000 square feet of new housing. And uh, something that was recently introduced to the plan uh, from HPD's uh, initiative is a 10% formerly homeless set aside. So we've added those um, at 27% AMI um, for formerly homeless folks. All right, uh, then we've got the site plan. So I think the building is contextual with the neighborhood. You can see we've got a slight setback from the street wall so that there can be some planted areas and a, a little bit of a um, soft landing for the residents. There will be street trees. There's a backyard, which is accessible to all the residents in the building at 63 Stockholm. Um, and it, it's touching those neighboring lots right there. So this is just for the 63 Stockholm site. I, I mean, um, I wanted to specify this building as the ULERP. Um, and out of the 20 units, you can see the unit sizes and the rents. We've been over this. Um, and then uh, the next slide shows you the other two buildings in the site, uh, 27, uh, 272 Jefferson Street and 332 Elder Street, which will both be four unit buildings, um, adding 37% uh, AMI to 80% AMI units to the building, uh, to the project rather. And uh, while um, 
63 Stockholm will be designed to the passive house standard. These buildings are a little too small to technically be passive house buildings, but they will still be using the same energy efficient methodologies in their construction style. So this is what the whole cluster looks like then when you add all 28 units together, uh, mostly two bedrooms because we're responding to community need for larger unit sizes for families. Um, but we've also got um, some studio units and one bedrooms and then you've got the whole uh, affordability distribution. Um, in prior iterations of this project, which we spoke to your office about, um, we were not utilizing the income averaging, uh, but this is now an early income averaging uh, project with HBD, which allowed us to add some deeper affordability um, in exchange for also adding a few, 70, a few more 77% AMI units. So there you can see uh, approximation of what the monthly rents would be for residents. Um, and that doesn't even, account for the formerly homeless units. I just want to say a little more about passive house design because this is an exciting thing that uh, we're trying to uh, emphasize that that should be become the norm for the building code in the city ideally and um, also for all architects working in the city to uh, have these skills in their shops. Essentially we have uh, thicker walls there and, in, and um, insulation which provides air tightness to the building so then you can have a lot more uh, temperature control creates better air quality for the residents you also utilize efficient equipment in the building um, low voltage equipment and uh, low flow water appliances and then um, we also have HVAC systems that use heat recapture and air source heat pumps uh, getting into the technical stuff um, but essentially a way to recycle the energy load and the heat usage in the building. Um, and then finally, um, we harness the sun with fo photovoltaics on the top, and we're hoping to work with NYSERDA to add a little additional financing um, and energy incentives to fund the solar grid on the ceiling of 63 Stockholm, I mean the roof. And the solar shading is a really cool thing. This is a building in Knickerbocker. It's called Knickerbocker Commons. It's a Riseboro building where you can see the angles of the exterior kind of blocks the light sometimes of year and allows it in at other times of year. I don't think our building has exactly that design, but it's part of the methodology of Passive House. Also wanted to emphasize another initiative that St. Nick's and Riseboro will be collaborating on for this project, which is to uh, employ local folks and MWBE folks in the construction and the operations of this building. So you can see right there, <laughs> essentially um, we will be uh, meeting all the local hiring requirements throughout the city, um, focusing on the Bushwick area and um, the Section 3. Um, also, we'll be meeting MWBE contractors and vendors to work on this project and ensure that the general contractor, who we do soon eventually will bring aboard, will be seeking those opportunities and will meet all of the HPD requirements for that. In fact, our architect is already helping us meet that as an MWBE organization. Um, this project will be listed in HPD's Higher NYC portal, and um, Riseboro and St. Nick's both have robust workforce development programs, and we're even opening a new training center in uh, Bushwick, right nearby, uh, the 332 Elder Building. So I'm looking forward to the opportunity to provide those services, not just for the residents, but for potential um, hires who will be working on the construction and operations of this building. And that's it. Uh, for now, any questions? Happy to speak about further. I just have one question. We're trying to do more when it comes to supportive housing in the city council. Well, some of us are trying to do more when it comes to supportive housing in the city council. Um, and we, we've been I, I talking about. I support Antonio fully. <laughs> we've been talking about uh, increasing uh, the homeless set asides from 10% to 15% in some cases. Um, is there an opportunity here to revisit that conversation about expanding and adding maybe an apartment or two? to have for 15% affordable, 15% uh, of it be uh, homeless set aside. Just wanted to know if we still have time to have a conversation about that. I think we do have time, and I'm definitely willing to have the conversation. Uh, Riseboro is open to that, and St. Nick's is, and of course, it's just a matter of the budget for the project. But we just recently added the 10% at HPD's behest, so I see no reason why we can't look at it again. 
Yeah, so I would love to have that conversation and be mindful that I don't necessarily want to increase the amount of 77 to 80% uh, units to offset that. Mm-hmm. So I just want more money. Uh, <laughs> that, or, uh, but I just, I, I would say that it's probably more affordable to house homeless families uh, in these units than it is to, you know, manage them to the homeless shelter system. So I think in, in comprehensively, the city would be saving money by having these these units available. So I really want to just have that conversation. I think because of the amount of units we're talking about here, it's probably like one more apartment. Uh, but please, let's have a conversation about it. Um, I don't want to go to the chair of the land use who's made a commitment to pushing for 15% set aside and not have that, um, not and that I don't follow through with that commitment um, outside of legislation. So if we could just have that conversation, it would be helpful. We outside can take that, that back to the finance team and see if we can make the numbers work. All right. And if you need me, give me a call, and I would be more than happy to help to make that happen. Um, and outside of that, I think the project looks, looks great, and I'm excited to see um, the development happen as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Uh, what portion of those who are going to be winning the lotteries or in your experience or, or that move into the affordable housing, how many of the folks are on the younger side? How many of the folks are on the older side? Uh, how many dis- folks who are disabled apply and get offers? And how many of your units will be fully accessible for tenants as well as if a tenant should happen to have somebody who uh, has a uh, mobility disability who would love them to be able to visit them or stay with them if there's a hurricane in Puerto Rico, per se. Right. So um, when we open projects like this to the housing lottery, we get sometimes 50,000 applications. I think it might have been something like upwards of 60,000 on our last building in Bushwick and uh, averaging more like 20,000, 30,000. So... Uh, it's a wide variety of folks. I actually don't work on the marketing of these buildings as I'm in the development team at Riseboro, but I know that we get a wide variety of folks, a lot of younger folks, a lot of seniors because Riseboro has a reputation for seniors. Um, and we also get a lot of families, which would be then, you know, children and parents. And, and children need elevators if you want to get that stroller. It's not easy to get strollers up four flights of steps. Right. Is there an elevator in the larger 20-unit building? There is no elevator currently planned. Uh, Is there an opportunity to provide an elevator so that seniors, families, people who become temporary disabled, uh, people who get pregnant, things like that can still have access to their fourth floor? Well, that would definitely change the design of the building substantially. Um, We do empathize with those needs, and we have a lot of buildings in our portfolio that meet those needs. And so what we have here in this project right now is there's one mobility, uh, fully uh, adaptable and accessible UFAS Section 503 unit on the ground floor in the 63 Stockholm building. One out of 20. One out of 20, which meets the 5% uh, requirement. And then there's another one in the elder building. Okay, so you're exceeding the requirements. If you do it by cluster, then technically it would be requiring 1.4, so we round it up to two, yeah. So we are exceeding the requirements technically, but we also, with the entire ground floor is going to be accessible and adaptable, although the, there's only one building that is UFAS in the, in the um, well, 63 Stockholm building. What, what is limiting you? It is, is it zoning? Is it DOB? Is it not enough funding from HPD? Well, our goal is always to create the most affordable housing as possible. And so we designed the building without the elevator and uh, sticking to the requirements of the HPD design guidelines and the accessibility handbook uh, so that we could get the most units. Would you be willing to share with me what section in the HPD design guidelines uh, tilted the scale towards not putting an elevator versus in favor? Because so if the HPD changed its guidelines, would you be able to add the elevator? Maybe so. I I would love to share that with you, but I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. But you you, prob- you can email it to me. It's, uh, it's policy at bencalos.com. Okay. Would you send cool. it to me before we vote on it? Um, sure. I'm, we have the architect also in the room and other folks that are working on the project. Um, are you comfortable having the architect answer questions? Is- maybe, maybe you could add um, some gloss to this. I, I do want to get to the bottom of it. Okay. I mean, I think 
we, from HPD's perspective, you know, they're following, they're even technically exceeding, you know, our requirements. Um, we share the goal of trying to maximize the number of units that we can within uh, a building. They have done that in this project. And I think, um, you know, we were talking before something that your team was saying was that because you have such a large portfolio, if the need should arise for a resident who, say, becomes disabled while they're living in the building, there could be an opportunity to, you know, move them to a different unit within the portfolio as needed. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're talking about two organizations that own a lot of, uh, of, of buildings in the area. Right. It's, Im it's important to note that we have senior buildings and supportive housing buildings in the neighborhood. So if we did have a resident who became disabled, needed an elevator in their building, we would try to find accommodations for them nearby, if possible. Hope that helps. Uh, thank you. Uh, I guess an another question is one of my colleagues uh, who may be sitting next to me frequently asks about uh, affordable housing, and so this is a question for HPD. Uh, so it seems that my, my colleague, uh, Councilman Reynoso, represents a, a community that is, has a high concentration of low-income communities of color. I, on the other hand, do not. I don't believe HPD has come to this committee with any projects for the east side. Uh, how, how can we work together so that the east side is building its share of housing at 30% of AMI at, at, at very low items to bring economic diversity to my district and the city? I'll let, I, since I said his name, I'll let Councilmember Reynoso jump in if he wants to add anything. I will. So part of one of my uh, foundational conversations that I have in this council and with the city, the problem I have with the administration is that um, they build the affordable housing, the supportive housing, um, exclusively in neighborhoods that are poor and of color, um, which uh, adds to the lack of diversity, to the segregation that we have in our city. Um, and I think HPD is unintentionally perpetuating segregation, um, which is a, it's a big problem for me. So. When I talk to Ben Kalos, who lives in a district that's a lot more affluent and white than mine, um, I ask him, you know, why and when are you going to do your part when it comes to addressing the affordability housing crisis? And he states to me that HPD doesn't allow for that to happen, that HPD hasn't given him any opportunities, that HPD is not presenting him with opportunities. So I would like to know um, why it is that m my district seems to be at the top of the list of places where we're building affordable housing and someone like his district, where I imagine the AMIs look a lot different than what my AMIs look like, um, he sees almost no affordable housing. And um, one thing I want to note it is to no fault of Council Member Kalos, who would actually want some affordable housing in his district. So just want to know where, where that, that comes in and whether or not we can have a rationale as to why he hasn't built any affordable housing since he's been a council member. <laughs> I mean, I think... Uh one of the things that limits where we can do some of these projects, like the one you're seeing right now, is where there's city-owned land that we can access for affordable housing. And the, you know, the situation is there's more city-owned land available in some places than others. That's part of it. Um, I will say, you know, there are also affordable housing preservation opportunities in the council members district. We have an Article 11 application we've been working with your office on for a, quite some time now. Um, some other things like that that we'd like to get moving. Um, but then I would also say, you know, we're working on this citywide process called Where We Live NYC, where we're really trying to tackle some of these questions and have, you know, a real citywide conversation about um, why people live where they live, where the opportunities are, how we can help folks access some of these high opportunity neighborhoods as they're called in the in the business um, and so you know I would encourage people to check out that initiative to participate in those conversations and you know we're gonna have a um, sorry we're doing a lot of note passing here we have a couple of updates I think um, you know, again, we're having a, a citywide conversation about this very issue, and we're expecting to make some related policy recommendations, I think, as soon as this fall. Can, can we get, so, you know, it, it's good to hear it um, the way you, you've presented it, but can we get the actual information? I would love to see the lack of opportunities in Ben Kalos's district, almost exclusively, specifically. How many 
you, um, city-owned sites are in his district. I would love to see that. Um, underutilized school land and backyards, uh, NYCHA developments and in and around NYCHA developments and opportunities to develop. If I can get that information, then I can I could feel more comfortable about the fact that um, that I wouldn't even consider him his district a high opportunity area. There are no opportunities in that district, and I would walk away from the argument that these mostly white affluent districts are almost are are you know not playing their part when it mm-hmm. comes to building affordable housing. I, so. I don't think I would let you because I think we are incumbent to find the affordability wherever it is and take on whatever challenges. So if we don't have vacant lots and I will, I will share my data set that I've provided with HPD. I've also sent a letter to HPD with every single closed church site for affordable housing and for school sites. Uh, the, the archdiocese happened to be selling off land in my district for, for, to raise money for certain reasons. And, uh, they're not raising money for good reasons. Uh, oh. I would I would just say to that that we're looking into um, we have done a couple of big like faith based uh, yep. development events in Manhattan. It's been a little while since we've done one. We're looking into doing that again pretty soon. Mm-hmm. Working with the Manhattan Borough President's Office on that. So we really we really do want to be connecting some of these um, church properties that have available land to make sure they know uh, about opportunities to work with us before they sell off. You know, for and market. actually, while well, I have the opportunity, I already asked uh, Commissioner Banks for a couple of mil- several million dollars to build shelters in my district. But uh, if HPD is able to help, and, and just for the record, we've got three affordable housing sites in my district since I've been council member. We're, we are hopefully opening 17 supportive housing beds with uh, WIN, but that is far less than we're seeing in your district just on this one item. And you've been in this committee a number of times, so uh, I please. If you can give some of the answers to Councilmember Reynoso and I, we are interested, and uh, but we won't take no for an answer. We need to figure out a way to build 30% AMI in this in the east side, even though there is higher land acquisition costs because equity is equity. And as the mayor frequently says about a garbage dump he's opening in my district this month, equity sometimes Yay. costs more. Uh, so I, I'm not mad at the garbage dump, but... Um, <laughs> I would, I, would, I would challenge even the council member in noting that Williamsburg has one of the highest land values in all of the city um, and in Bushwick, uh, Bushwick and Williamsburg. Um, I, would, I would see what those prices look like. They're actually com- com- uh, comparable, so that, that shouldn't be a deterrent to being able to build affordable housing. Um, I agree that you know, Williamsburg and Bushwick and other places, um, land value um, tends to be a conversation as to why we can't build as much of affordable, as affordable housing that we want. Um, so I don't want that to be the excuse by HPD, but I would like that for myself to see that um, just what his district is going through, so that I can um, advocate with facts um, as opposed to just anecdotes and, and like personal experiences. Yeah, I think we have a lot of that already through where we live. Um, I'll take a look at what we can share. Uh, I want to just try to continue impressing my colleague here. Uh, one of the questions I often have started asking uh, as of this year when I had too much time on my hands, is whether or not the uh, AMIs, the actual rents, if you can pull up the slides with the actual rents that show that it is from 366 to $1,738, whether or not that will have a gentrifying effect. I prefer to focus on the census district, uh, census tract, and under the DCP census tract, it shows that about, uh, about most of the, I would say, sorry, 90, 84% of the housing is actually under $1,999,000. I'll show Councilman Reno. So, uh, so about 20% is 1500 to 1999. Uh, 23% is $1,000 to 1499. Uh, and 23% is from 500 to 1000. Uh, and only 12% is less than 500. So I guess the question is, is it HPD's analysis and Riseboro's that these units are going to present additional affordability in the community or just preserve the status quo of the affordability currently seen in the community? I mean, so this is a scatter site is, I don't project. Think There's actually three buildings. So, you know, if we look at it in the neighborhood level, um, about 64% of people in Bushwick make 80% AMI or less, which comports with the range that you see here. So I think people in the, in the neighborhood will be able to qualify for these units. This, this is one of the, 
I, I like projects when I see 80% and below. You are very lucky. Uh, so I'm going to go through some of the other uh, questions I tend to ask. and. Uh, um, not to belabor it, but do you want me to give you the info that I just received from the architect related to the first question? Yes. Cool. Mm. In hopes of uh, moving on with the vote without needing to uh, review yes, yes, the yes, yes. floor plans. I'm very happy. Um, she just wanted to clarify that there actually 25% of the cluster is accessible because while I was referring to the Section 503 UFAS units, of which there are two, there's actually five, all five units on the ground floor of the Stockholm building are accessible and adaptable. So... That's a lot better. And also one in Elder and one in the Jefferson building. And then does the architect, do they happen to write down what section of the HPD uh, design <laughs> guidelines is running afoul of the elevator? No, it's but not. they did mention in another source here that it's because of the building code. Uh, a, a building that is four stories or less is not required to have an elevator. I. Uh, but do we know if the building code prevents an elevator and if the zoning code penalizes making something accessible that is four stories because if it is i'd be interested in changing the building code and the zoning code oh, I, I don't i don't think that's quite accurate but essentially we would have to lower the number of units in the building and it would also add uh construction cost and uh energy cost to the sure. project yeah. construction and energy where i think the city should be able to cover in terms of the, the problem trying to solve is elevators don't take up floor area ratio. So I'm, I'm, okay, so I, I'm hearing from the audience that they, they do, which is, anyway, I, would, would the architects be willing to give some pro bono advice on what changes would need to happen in order to get this elevator in without costing units? My team thinks no, but, well, I mean, you know, we'll, it's, so, Okay, well, we we'll, will continue, continue to have this conversation at every answer. single item that comes before this committee. Uh, who is the contractor on this project? No. So, okay, we're at maximum building envelope is what I'm being told, so there's not really a way to add an elevator without losing units. Okay, so I, I've had a conversation with Department of City Planning. What they're looking for from me is specifically instances such as this where if you can give me the design constraints and where the envelopes, so I'm guessing this is a quality housing uh, building? Um, I believe so. Quality housing is one of the only ones with the envelope restriction. So uh, I just need to know what we need to do so that when it's 100% affordable like this, we can just relax the envelope and whether it's through BSA special permit or DCP creating a new change citywide, I would really like to get to a place where we're doing uh, 100, when it's 100% affordable housing, that we're relaxing certain standards to get 100% accessibility. Uh, who is the contractor? Not selected yet. Uh, when will the project start? Um, we're hoping for construction closing in spring of 2020, uh, or potentially as early as like December or January 2020. When, when is my colleague going to be standing there with a shovel? <sighs> I'm hoping spring 2020. A any, any reason why it'll take a year? Well, this ULIP process is currently the critical path for the project. So once we pass so the ULIP... We'll vote in a, in a week. It's 2019. How do we get shovels in the ground now versus next year? Because we're also going to be applying for the 9% tax credit applications, the HPD tax credit applications, which will be going in maybe August, September and then we'll be awarded, and then that's when we could close. So then it, after that, it would be a question of getting the finances in order, working up the paperwork, and closing. And having the approvals in place before they do the tax credit application puts them in a much better potential place to get those tax credits. What are the construction hard costs on? The pro total project costs, according to testimony on the Stockholm side, are 14.6 million. What are the hard costs? It's, I think it's about 12 million. Sorry, that was for the whole project, not just not not a site specific number. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's twelve million hard costs for all three buildings. I don't have the budget exactly in front of me, but uh, what are your uh, s soft costs? It's about two million. What are your developer fees? Um, don't know off the top of my head, but it's within the co the soft cost number. Uh, no, that's not accurate. It's not. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Are you going to defer developer fees? I believe yes. Um, that is a part of the financing plan. 
there was another developer who at the last hearing said I should start asking how, what you're going to do with the developer fees. Is it going to go into somebody's pocket or is it going to go into your community? Good question. And nonprofits love answering that question because it's we true. can talk about all other of the programs <laughs> that we run and all of the staff that we hire from the community. And we will be reinvesting those profits 50-50 between St. Nick's and, and Risebro in our services and our staff and um, keeping our organizations strong. Uh, Councilman Moreno, sir, for a follow-up. So just having a general conversation with HPD, who I, I think um, for some reason when we talk at these hearings, we've, we're, we're, we're on the same page, but it does, the policy just doesn't fall in line with it. The developer fees are a perfect example of funding that is necessary for uh, folks like Riseboro and St. Nick's to do the work that you want when it comes to the preservation of units, um, but almost never get an opportunity to have in sites that are exclusively given to private developers. Um, so it's just another example of a cycle by which in the past, these not-for-profit um, organizations used to be able to protect people through the money they make from developer costs of buildings that they were building. Once you stop the giving them the opportunities to build affordable housing or to build housing in general, you cut us a life. You cut a lifeline in regards to the amount of funding they get to do this work. Um, so they've had to come through other places like city council, the state, and federal funding um, to to for the expense budget um, for expense budget requests, um, so they can continue to do their work. So there was a cycle that worked. It was cut during the Bloomberg administration. Is existed all the way through until now in the Bloom into the the Blasio administration. It's the same practices where you cut off an important lifeline. And this is a perfect example right here of a building that's going to give them developer fees. That's going to allow for them again to fight against evictions, which is something you want. Um, to ensure that other buildings are taken care of and they can staff not only through lawyers but through organizing um, to do on the ground work that again you seem to value but don't seem to support when it comes to allowing for them to take on projects of development. Uh, so I just want to make sure I had that conversation when I hear developer fees deferred um, you know I want to have the conversation in context. It's not deferred like they're not going to take it they're going to put it back into the building. Sometimes the deferment means that no one's pocketing it and they're putting it back into the organization to do their work. So just want to have clarification in that and just this, what I think a hypocritical uh, request of HPD in the city for organizing and eviction assistance, uh, but not support on the construction side, which used to allow for uh, funding to go into those services. That was a statement. So no, it's not. I would love to see private developers defer as much of their fees as I see from nonprofits. Uh, will there be an on-site super? That is um, currently being discussed internally uh, related to our property management needs. Uh, the proposal before you today does not include a supers unit, but we will. But that person will be in a building right down the street that Riceboro operates. Will there be any commercial units? No. What is the value of the of the uh, city land being disposed? I don't know. Um, yeah, um, the market appraisal value of the city-owned lots are three million one hundred forty thousand for sixty-three Stockholm, and seven hundred and ninety thousand for um, three thirty-two Alder. I also want to correct the record on a prior question, which I knew I totally pulled out of my head. Mm -hmm. The Construction cost in the performer, which is still totally subject to change, is actually more around 10 million, not 12. Okay, so then it is four million dollars in soft costs. Actually, 4.5. No, it's it's a little less. Um, and there's some other things in there like contingency and. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's more like. Um, so what are the soft costs? This will make right Antonio here. happy. Oh yeah. Uh, Wait, that's not good. The way it's adding here is, is strange, but it's about 1.4 in soft costs proper for the pre-development phase, and then we have financing fees and carrying costs on top that brings it up to like a little more than $2 million. I, I The project is very much still in the pre-financing and That's good news. Underwriting is... percent set aside. <laughs> and perhaps even for this elevator I'm uh, hoping to get in every building. Uh, what is the value of the uh, tax abatement for 420C? We don't do that calculation for the 420C. 
I will continue to ask because I think it is valid. It is a 40-year tax abatement as of right? Um, it's a 30-year regulatory period. And it is a full tax abatement? Yes. On a, uh, what is, and what is the assessed value for the property once it will be built? I, I can back into the tax, <laughs> I can figure I out what the tax uh, abatement would be under 420 C if you won't give it to us. Okay, we will, we will look into it so we can just know exactly how much we're doing it. Is there any additional HPD subsidy? No, just um, the, no, there's just not. It's about, it, the city subsidy is about 19% of TDC. Thank you. Uh, under which program? The NCP. Uh, is there any HDC financing, first no, mortgage? No. Any uh, federal money, state money, city capital? NYSERDA, the, the um, energy research um, mm -hmm. organization, technically that is state money, although that financing is also still in flux. How much are you expecting that financing to account for? Um, it would depend on the energy modeling of the building. If we can actually uh, get the performance that we anticipate, then we could have, uh, I think the budget currently has 125000 for NYSERDA uh, incentives based right. on the solar panels. There's no upzoning here, right? It's just the zoning is staying the same. Uh, okay, here, here's the other quick question. Uh, the folks who will be building these buildings and those who are operating it, will they get paid enough money so that they won't qualify for the affordable housing? Or will they be paying, getting paid so little that they will actually need the affordable housing that they are building, which means it will be making the crisis worse? The mayor is very fond of saying the best way we can get out of the affordable housing crisis is by paying people more. So what does the pay look like? Will the people have health insurance if they get hurt on the job? Or do they just have to rely on workers' comp? Will they one day be able to retire because they have access to a retirement vehicle? This is for the construction workers and the people who operate. So Riseboro and St. Nick's are committed to working with general contractors who have these protections for their workers as well. But since we have not selected the general contractor, I can't speak to the exact conditions that their workers will enjoy. But of course, they will follow all of the uh, local hiring, etc. However, this is not a prevailing wage project. Um, as for the um, employees of Riseboro, who will be operating the building and also uh, developing the building. Um, our staff, I believe, is well taken care of. We all have health insurance at Riseboro. And our property management staff is 32BJ unionized. So those folks will have all of those benefits and uh, union pay rates. Uh, you mentioned a lot in your presentation, which I really uh, appreciate. If somebody is watching right now, and they are a constituent of Councilmember Antonio Reynoso, and they would like a job, building or maintaining one of these three properties, uh, who should they call? How do they get that job? I think you can uh, reliably contact the project managers, which is myself and Philip, um, and those are the main lines for the housing offices at Riseboro and St. Nick's. If you can read them into the record for folks watching at TV or on the live stream. Yes. This so is the committee to watch if you want jobs. <laughs> right. And, I, and I'll qualify this after I read these contact informations, but... My name is Drew Vanderberg, dvanderberg at riseboro.org. Uh, that's D-V-A-N-D-E-R-B-U-R-G at riseboro, R-I-S-E-B-O-R-O dot org. 718-366-3800 is the main line for our housing office. And then St. Nick's Alliance, Philip, I'm going to share your contact info with the whole city. Uh, <laughs> P. Hoffman at St. Nick's org. That's P-H-O-F-M-A-N-N at St. Nick's Alliance dot org. 718-388-5454. So you could start with the project managers, but they will refer you within the organization to probably the uh, Workforce Development Training Center, the staff there at the time that the housing uh, is available or the jobs are being offered. Um, Riseboro has Level Up program. You could find that at riseboro.org, and you could also just visit stnixalliance.org and apply through those websites. This is one of the, my favorite parts of the hearing. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Reno, so what languages are spoken in this part of your district most predominantly? English and Spanish, uh, predominantly. My, 
my, my, my question to uh, Riseboro and St. Nick's is, and this was also suggested by another developer, uh, what languages will marketing occur in? What languages will lease up occur in? Uh, how do you intend to make this accessible uh, to uh, the broader New York City community, which incidentally speaks over 800 different languages? Right. So um, in the marketing uh, process, we have the HPD standard forms and paperwork, which has many languages on there. Um, and I believe there's also a whole list of protocols that HPD requires for language accessibility in the marketing. Meanwhile, our community is largely Spanish speaking. We also have a large Mandarin Cantonese uh, population in some of our senior buildings. So we have staff at Riseboro who can offer at least those two languages. If you walk in in person and want to fill out an application, we can help you do that. And will you engage in proactive outreach to uh Certainly. Spanish speaking and, and Mandarin and other Chinese dialect speaking communities? Certainly. That is great. Uh, this is the toughest question I have for you. If there is a question that I have missed that you think I should ask you as well as other developers, there's two more today. Um, I, I would think you should ask everyone about the energy performance of their buildings and the sustainability features on their buildings because that's something that we love to emphasize. Can, can, I, can I mention your name? Because uh, I feel like folks are going to get grumpy with me for that one. But Sure. Yeah, I mean, say, well, actually, that's up to you. But you can, you can say we know some really cool nonprofits in Bushwick that are doing this stuff. So They will, they will think I'm a hipster, but that is fine. Uh, Council Member uh, Reynoso, do you have any uh, final questions? No, I just want to thank uh, uh, both Riseboro and St. Nick's, but just um, the performance from Riseboro is a perfect example of like how in-depth and how much they care about what's happening in the community. Uh, we take this very seriously, even though it might just be 20, 28 units or, or uh, that might not seem significant. To us, it's very important. I just really appreciate um, how you answered all the questions. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Thank you to HPD. Looking forward to getting that one extra unit for supportive housing. <laughs> Thank you to Council Marinoso for his partnership over the past five years, his friendship for caring about the, the same things, for having excellent staffers over the past uh, four years, e even if we, we may question some of their decisions at certain points. Uh, but uh, thank you and thank you for staying for the whole hearing and then also being cool with uh, what I've been told might be the third or fourth degree. Uh, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing on land use items 357 and 358, and they will be laid over. Our second hearing is land use 347, Cooper Square, MHA, Phase 1, in the District of Councilmember Chin and Councilmember Rivera in Manhattan. Cooper Square Mutual Housing Association's portfolio includes 21 limited equity co-op buildings, selling 327 units, 22 commercial spaces would sit on community land trust. Cooper Square is renovating its portfolio of buildings in a multi-phase project. Through HPD's Green Housing Preservation Program, the renovations will include capital improvements as well as energy efficiency, water conservation upgrades, they are lucky because they're about to get this new question on it. Uh, HPD is seeking the termination of the prior exemption of the site and a new 40-year Article 11 tax exemption pursuant to Article 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law to facilitate this work. I'd like to, from the public hearing on this application, would like to invite HPD to testify uh, if the council could please administer the oath. So um, just Lacey, just a reminder, you're still under oath. And for Mr. Powell, I believe, um, can you please state your name for the record? And do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? David Powell, and yes, I do. You may begin. OK. Uh, land use item number 347 consists of an exemption area containing 21 no equity cooperative buildings with 327 units and 22 occupied commercial spaces which sit on a community land trust. Uh, the buildings are located in Manhattan Council Districts 1 and 2 and are known as Cooper Square Mutual Housing Association or MHA. The buildings are planned for rehabilitation through HPD's Green Housing Preservation Program or GHPP. The properties in the MHA portfolio were former public sites that were taken into city ownership through either condemnation or in-rem tax foreclosure between 1975 and 1989. 
1991, the city entered into a mutual housing association program lease with the MHA and CLT, whereupon the city agreed to renovate the buildings and convey them to the MHA. Between 1994 and 2003, the city conveyed the buildings for $1 each to the current owner through HPD's mutual housing program and the tenant interim lease two program with the intention of converting all of the units from rental to a no equity cooperative model. In July 2012, the conversion was completed upon approval of an Article 11 tax exemption. Recently, the shareholders entered into HPD's Green Housing Preservation Program, or GHPP, which provides low or no interest loans to finance energy and water conservation improvements, as well as lead mediation and moderate rehabilitation work. The goal of the program is to assist small and mid-sized building owners to lower operating expenses, reduce energy consumption, and ensure the long-term physical and financial health of their buildings, as well as preserve safe and affordable housing for low and moderate income New Yorkers. While subject to change, the current plan is to rehabilitate all of the buildings in the portfolio in four phases over the course of three years. The rehabilitation will consist of upgrades to the envelope of the buildings, installation of low flow fixtures, installation of solar panels on the roof, and upgrades to the heating and hot water systems. The first phase consists of five buildings, and phases two through four are planned to cover the remaining 16 buildings. For all phases, all work will be done with tenants in place. The estimated total development cost for phase one is $1,095,442. Cost estimates for future phases are not yet determined. Incomes for future purchasers will be capped at 80% of AMI, which is approximately $83,440 for a family of four, and maintenance charges range from $431 for a studio to $875 for a three-bedroom apartment. In an effort to help facilitate continued affordability for these home ownership units, HPD is before the Council seeking Article 11 tax benefits that will replace the current tax exemption. The 40-year exemption will run coterminous with the new HPD loan, uh, as well as, but not contingent upon, any subsequent loans HPD will make to the remaining 16 buildings in the portfolio. The estimated cumulative value of the tax exemption is $34,286,327, with a net present value of $9,578,614. Are we no longer using the screen? Yeah, we're, he has testimony, but not a presentation. Let's just close the laptop. Good. And uh, you may begin. So uh, thank you, Chair Kellis, for uh, this opportunity to testify. First of all, just apologizing that my testimony actually says that this is before the Land Use Committee, uh, <laughs> not the Planning Committee, but uh, I'm getting ahead I'll of take the stuff. promotion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just wanted to, since Lacey talked a little bit about the project itself, I just want to talk a little bit about us because our organization and our model is somewhat unique, um, uh, although it's uh, expanding and growing in the present moment, which we're very excited about. Um, as Lacey mentioned, we're a, a scattered site, low-income housing co-op. And um, I think one distinction to make uh, between us and other HDFC-based uh, scattered site co-ops or co-ops generally, is that from our inception, we have had a, um, a dedication to permanent affordability, which is baked into our model. And, and that's primarily due to the fact that the land underneath our buildings is owned by a land trust. Um, we have a 99-year lease with this uh, distinct entity, the Cooper Square Community Land Trust, uh, which is renewable. And up until two years ago, we were the only um, organization and co-op with this structure uh, recently, HPD and the Enterprise Foundation have infused um, uh, $1.65 million to other burgeoning community land trusts, uh, including Interboro CLT, El Barrio CLT, uh, um, Mott Haven, Port Morris CLT, to name a few. And we're very excited about that um, uh, development and look forward to working with the council and this subcommittee and supporting uh, permanently affordable uh, land trust based housing. Um, in our case, again, this is a this is a home ownership model. Uh, we're a co-op, and um, without subsidy, our our co-ops uh, are currently the maintenance fees in our co-ops are currently affordable to households making 25 percent to 40 percent of AMI, which has been, as has been discussed today is a a um, demographic and income group that's frequently left out of almost uh, all affordable housing programs heretofore, especially uh, home ownership ones. So we're very 
pleased that the uh, GHPP will allow us to address some of our capital needs while at the same time maintaining that depth of affordability. Um, just to be clear, uh, just anticipating some of your questions, Councilman, uh, based on the pri previous project. So this is a fully occupied um, preservation project. Uh, so there's no initial rent up. Um, I can talk to you uh, very lovingly and at length about our existing community. But, um, you know, we're, we're a multi-generational um, um, co-op. And just to give you an idea, our last three board chairs were second and third generation uh, Cooper Square residents. So we are holding down an intergenerational community uh, in a very, very gentrified part of the Lower East Side. We're an island of affordability. And um, most of the movement in our units when they become vacant go to, um, frankly, accommodating seniors uh, who are on upper floors um, who need the accommodation to uh, an accessible apartment or to families that have expanded um, let's say a, a second generation now has a family of their own and they're living in a one bedroom apartment with their parents to accommodate our people who um, can't afford to live anywhere else in the neighborhood. So um, just want to sort of make that distinction between the previous project that was talked about and, and ours um, in addition to it being a green housing preservation program project specifically, um, you know, it is a, it is a preservation. Um, and I think I'll leave it there and entertain questions along with Lacey. I guess the other thing we want to just say is, um, you know, a big part of this project is energy efficiency and specifically um, getting solar panels on, on our buildings. That's going to be a first step for us in that direction. Uh, we've participated in weatherization and other energy efficiency uh, programs before, but it's the first time that we're embracing solar and um, energy independence. And as a Sandy impacted community, um, we are very excited about that and um, you know, looking forward to taking that next step with, uh, with HPD. Um, I also want to just give some praise to the, the HPD staff. It took us a little while to get to this point. It was a process of negotiation and collaboration, but one thing we're also very excited about is that um, we are accessing the funds for this program without going into debt. That's been historically a big part of what's made our organization financially successful and allowed us to hit such low levels of, uh, um, or deep levels of affordability rather, uh, without additional subsidy. And so we're very happy that we're gonna be able to um, maintain not just uh, the physical integrity of the buildings or five of our 21 buildings in this case in phase one, but also the fact that the uh, arrangement is financially sustainable for us as well. Do any of, so most of you, the, these are, this is several, I think this is over a dozen buildings? This is, um, our co-op is a 21 building scattered site co-op, but this, um, this particular project touches five buildings and 87 units. Are, do any of them have, are any of them accessible or are they all walk-ups? These are all, so these were, just to give you a little bit of backstory, these were all gut renovated um, in the 1990s at a time where the city was, you know, uh, for better and for worse, less um, less aware of its responsibility to, I mean, really for worse, uh, to house people who were uh, in need of that kind of accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, but also sort of acknowledging um, some of the issues that came up in the previous project. We are These are, uh, you know, old law tenement buildings that are, you know, end to end. So... Um, an elevator removes units. And so what happened in the 1990s is that these were renovated um, as walk-ups and they continue to be so. I often say that I do not have a magic wand, which isn't quite true because I do have a replica Harry Potter, but um, in the one place that I am very interested in is what laws, is it zoning law? Is it building code? It's a little bit of both, is in the way of going back in and putting in some sort of elevator that can provide some sort of accessibility to the higher floors and some sort of visitabil visiting ability for people who have accessibility challenges um, and uh, at, at what cost. So the tenements, because uh, I've spent way too much time looking at this, uh, have the uh, we call it air shafts, they call it courtyards, but uh, that little space between the building is actually called a courtyard. And so the question is, 
uh, where the courtyard is adjacent to the stairwell, and in most cases it actually usually is, uh, whether or not there is space to do it there and whether you or your association would have any interest in digging a little bit deeper on if we could raise the magic wave the magic wand for you and your 200 or 300 units as well as all the other folks living in tenements throughout our city and all of a sudden have elevators available for you to add, especially if it's 100% affordable portfolio that or 100% rent stabilized um, that we would do it. Do you have any ideas? Well, uh, I'll just say I think for uh, the the magic wand to to a large degree is money, right? So if there if programmatically funds are made available to um, study and implement elevators into all of our buildings without affecting the affordability of our units, mm -hmm. we would be a hundred percent behind that. Um, and in fact, you know, recognize that that is that that is a need. I think the other piece of this is because we're a fully occupied co-op. You know, when we're talking about um, one or two households or even a half dozen households, checkerboarding people to vacant units is possible. When we're talking about an entire building uh, getting essentially a gut renovation, um, then that becomes um, a where do you put people issue. Um, and we want to be, you know, as, as a fully occupied co-op, um, we certainly don't want to displace anybody. And we also would have to, you know, figure out how do we manage that disruption and literally, you know, where do people go? Um, in a 20-unit building, for example. In, in terms of the work that you're doing, will any tenants need to be re relocated? No. Okay. Uh, in terms of the, the money wand, I, I do have a, a small budget of $92 billion. Okay. So it's up from $89 <laughs> billion. Uh, So that magic wand is one piece. I think the other piece is just any regulatory hurdles. Mm -hmm. if, if, all you're, if, if, if all you're saying is we actually just need $250,000, and X number of dollars to handle relocation, then I would just need to know that so I could go back to HPD, which will be having its hearing soon on the budget very soon, and say, hey, I need X number of million dollars to do this at this site and many sites like it. Uh, in terms of the contractor, have you selected one yet? Um, yes, an RFP was put out by uh, HPD, and the contractor selected is a nonprofit uh, organization, Habitat for Humanity New York. Will Jimmy Carter show up to do this work? <laughs> yeah. you know, HPD just said yes. <laughs> Um, no, I we think that was a joke. That. And uh, no, for sure. nobody I may is. hold up this project unless Jimmy <laughs> Carter calls me or agrees to show up. We'll do our best. <laughs> Every time I hear that, I'm just like, I need to meet Jimmy Carter. Yeah. Uh, the the project is a uh, project costs are one million ninety five thousand four hundred forty two dollars according to the testimony. Uh, how much of that is hard cost? How much of that is soft cost? So um, I have. Most of it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're going to need something to either repeat what you're saying or for you to in. hop up there, say your name, and get yeah, sworn in. Come up. Come up. <laughs> I'm Gary Haskell. Let me just um, yes. swear you in. Can you say your name for the record? And yeah. do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Uh, my name is Dari Askell, and yes, I do. So, I th so the soft costs are very, very minimal here. Um, probably around like thirty thousand dollars, and most of it's hard costs. Yeah. So thirty thousand for administrative costs. Yeah. Do you have? So, so we have soft costs. Is we we broke it up into two pieces just to explain to our board. Um, we've spent already about seventeen thousand five um, for an engineering uh, report and asbestos testing uh, because roof replacement on two of these buildings is part of the scope. And we anticipate about another 385 for uh, TA training, legal fees, benchmarking, title report, insurance, et cetera. So it's a uh, little less than 60. Any developer? Any developer fee whatsoever? No. Please make sure to fill out a witness slip. Uh, uh, your project has commercial units. Are those commercial units uh, being uh, made available at market rate, which in your part of the city is quite high, in order to cross-subsidize the affordable units? Or are the uh, commercial units, they themselves, affordable for uh, local businesses? 
Um, four out of the five buildings do have commercial units, and I would say that it's a it's a little bit a little bit of both. So most definitely, the rents of the uh, commercial spaces cross subsidize our housing. About twenty seven percent of our annual budget um, comes from uh, rents that we collect from commercial spaces. We do not in the two subject buildings, but we do have uh, one or two nonprofits um, that are in our in our uh, commercial spaces, and we do actually have actually in one of the um, one of the one of the subject buildings, we actually have a resident entrepreneur who opened their own restaurant um, on the ground floor. So that's at a submarket rent. Is there anything that stops you from kicking all those tenants out, renting it to yet another bank or yet another Starbucks? and uh, making it account for 100% and just letting the people stay there for free? Um, legally, no, but we are an organization that um, comes out of the anti-displacement movement. Um, those buildings were literally secured by uh, people who lived in them and um, fought uh, in succession Robert Moses, uh, drug dealers and arsonists, uh, gentrifiers and speculators, and then the city itself in order to um, get self-ownership of, of the housing. So displacing businesses is not something that we, even though we are cross-subsidizing our housing and housing is the primary mission of the organization, uh, displacing businesses, uh, particularly uh, long-term um, small mom and pop businesses, uh, is not something that we aim to do. And we, you know, we definitely work with businesses to keep them in the neighborhood. And I will point out also that, um, you know, these are very small uh, commercial storefronts, you know, two, 200 to 300 square feet. So you're not generally going to get a Starbucks um, or a bank fitting in a space of that size. But um, we endeavor to keep our, our local merchants where you'd they are. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised where banks are squeezing in on the east side at this point. It's kind of scary. Right, right. Last thing we need in the east side is another bank. Uh, the, the units that will become vacant during your 40-year period are currently, I'm very grateful to hear, so HPD has a cap of 120% on their regulatory agreement, but you are volunteering to go down to 80%. Does that 80%, uh, is that higher, lower, or maintaining the status quo for the current AMIs that you are seeing in the neighborhood? You mentioned it being an island. What is the surrounding AMI? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I couldn't even tell you except to just say, you know, insane, right? For our community, um, you know, the the pace of gentrification has been um, massive and uh, we have really been more focused on making sure that our housing is affordable to our people rather than sort of tracking the the incomes of the affluent around us. I will say that, um, so our current regulatory agreement is pegged at 80% of AMI, as you mentioned, and we are, are currently affordable to 25 to 40% of AMI. Um, a great deal of our units were uh, tenant occupied when we became a co-op. And so um, the vast majority of our residents were um, at incomes that are much less than 80% of AMI. So we always treat that as a kind of, you know, as a sort of, um, distant ceiling uh, and, and, and limitation. But in fact, um, most of our people are well below 50% uh, of AMI. And um, we are aiming to keep our, our maintenance fees at that level. And so far, we've been successful, again, without subsidy. Thank you. Uh, give me one second. I'm just looking up the AMI for the census track at East 4th Street. And it looks like the uh, Median family income is 71438 uh, which would take you closer to 90% 90, 90, yeah. 90 of the AMI. Yeah. So that is uh, good news. Uh, do you have existing debt on the project? Um, we have a small loan of, I think, 84000 that is historical and yeah. has not, <laughs> HPD has not... <laughs> <laughs> made made requests on that, so it's it's a little bit in a state of limbo. But eventually, will HPD we'll forgive the note as part of this in order to gain our approval? Will we forgive the note? No, no, but we'll. I, I, I don't think we would forgive the note, but <clears throat> we're gonna do a lost note affidavit. We we are we are literally giving how many? Thirty four million. Uh, nine point. Six million dollars in that present value in tax uh, abatements, but we're gonna be sticklers over the eighty thousand. So. 
Okay. Uh, in terms of the uh, work that is being done and how the buildings are maintained, do people earn enough income that they don't need affordable housing at 80% of AMI? Do they have health insurance? Uh, do you have access to retirement vehicles such as 401ks or better yet, a defined benefit uh, for both the people who will be doing the work that has been, but I, I don't even know what Habitat for Humanity's uh, requirements are, but uh, for both the additions and the uh, maintenance. So I, I can't speak to um, the Habitat for Humanity's um, you know, wage scale, as you, as you alluded to. Uh, in terms of our own staff, um, uh, it, it really depends on the position, right? So you're talking about an organization that has office staff and maintenance staff, which would include um, people with pretty serious hard skills like boiler mechanics um, who are making, you know, $35 an hour and upwards. Mm -hmm. And then you have, you know, porters, you know, um, who are cleaning our buildings. And um, some of them actually are, some of our staff, we do have a handful of staff that are residents uh, as well as uh, two super units. Um, but the, the porter salaries are going to be, um, you know, much lower than the boiler mechanic salaries, you know, be a, a starting, a starting porter salary would be about 16 an hour. Um, so, so above minimum wage. Yes. And do they have health insurance? Yes. Full benefits and a simple IRA. That, that is sadly better than most of the developers we see here. So that is, uh, great news. Okay, let me just... Uh, I don't know Habitat for Humanities. I don't think they've been here. I think the Habitat that we did have here was like a local branch. Um, do we know whether, can we make sure that if you award the contractor that they're here to answer, do you know about the MWBE and whether they're going to be satisfying the MWBE requirements? You hired an engineer. Are they an MWBE? Yeah. So this project actually doesn't trigger the MWBE requirement because it's under $2 million. But we would agree that even if it's not triggered, we still want to hit those goals. For sure. Um, but they're just not required to by, by law. Okay. Uh, is, is Cooper Square MHA <laughs> committed to trying to work with uh, MWBEs on this project? We are. Our, our um, construction consultant um, is a woman-owned and women staff firm. And that's Susan Trainer Associates. If somebody is interested in working in one of your buildings, and you already said that you have some of your tenants doing so, uh, and I imagine this doesn't get triggered on this project either, but is interested in doing the solar work and developing some of those hard skills to put solar on other buildings, uh, are you participating in local hire? Will I get one of my favorite moments during every hearing now, or not so much? Well, we're we're working with contractors and subcontractors, and the job is you know it's not um, it's it's not uh, ground up construction, right? So we're working with you know boiler companies and solar installers. Um, the again, we've already mentioned that Habitat for Humanity. By the way, it is Habitat for Humanity New York, so it is the local affiliate of the national organization. Just to be clear, there are about. even sub affiliates within each borough that we've had. Oh, is that right? Here, okay. uh, well, it's so the one that has their offices here downtown. That's that's who we typically deal with. It, um, so I guess, is there an opportunity for local hire, or is that too much to ask given the size of this project? Probably given the size of this project, that's um, not realistic. I will say that um, the, I mean, yeah, I think they hire it, does, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't necessarily trigger the requirement, but in terms of, I, I think it's more by virtue of, of hiring local firms that are existent in, in New York City, as opposed to, I think what you're speaking of, council member, is, you know, if somebody is, a, is trying to get into the trades, you know, could this be a gateway? And I think the answer is no. But I think to, to Dara's point, the side here is that we are working with local contractors and local firms. So, yeah. Thank you for being Community Land Trust. I, I know there are folks uh, sitting in this room who are incredibly enthusiastic about Community Land Trust. I believe public advocate, now Attorney General James, had legislation on it, which is now being carried by uh, former Progressive Caucus co-chair Donovan Richards. Sounds right. Uh, and so it is something we are interested in. I would love to sit down at another point to, to learn more and see if we can use that model elsewhere as uh, perhaps as an alternative to uh, Neighborhood Restore and, and some other folks of just trying to really build out these land trusts so you don't end up in a situation where 
uh, as we have with almost everyone else here, it's a situation of like, oh my God, in 10 years or five years, they're going to have a regulatory agreement expire. And in this case, it's like, we own the land. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, is there anyone from the public who is here to uh, testify on this item? Uh, seeing none, I will now uh, uh, close the public hearing on land use item 347. And, oh, sorry, before I close it, is there a question I didn't ask you that I should have that I should ask everyone else? Well, I just, um, I think asking people about permanent affordability is really important. And, um, you know, I'd be remiss if you, I think you hit, hit the nail right on the head is, uh, the land trust model and permanent affordability vis-a-vis -vis that vehicle uh, takes you further into the future than the city can anticipate or is willing to commit to at this time. <laughs> and um, so I think that's good to push people on. And I just want to also thank you for raising the issue of possibly retrofitting old buildings with elevators. And I look forward to following up with you on that conversation. I, I need the expertise because literally city planning is, believes that there's no impediment and I just need to be able to show them and a concrete example, what we're, we're rezoning the city right now as we speak to get rid of voids. Mm -hmm. So that just to get really cynical and off topic, we're putting up buildings that are supposed to be 20, 23 stories tall, but a 23 story tall building at 249 East 62nd Street is gonna be 500 feet tall because after 12 stories, they're gonna put in 150 feet of nothing. And then they're gonna have 11 stories so that they can build apartments for billionaires and charge them a lot. The mechanicals, yeah. Uh, it's mm -hmm. the mechanical voids. And so once we were able to show examples to DCP, so for DCP's purposes, they need to see like, mm -hmm. here are buildings where we would be able to add elevators. It would cost X much, uh, this much money from HPD and this much, this would be the change in the bulk and use. And we did that in zoning for quality and affordability. That was supposed to be what it was supposed to help us do. We added additional height and bulk in different places. So I'm that, that is a place I'm very interested in. I know that Council Member Reynoso and other people who have worked with him are also interested. Uh, I will also say I agree with you on the permanent affordability. At least yours is 99 years. I, I would love to get to, like, deed restrictions. <laughs> It's nine, yes, there's there is that, and it's. I want to point out it's a renewable lease, so you know, um, you, we won't. Do you be have in the a room, restriction but, on your? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I will go back. Yeah, we I will, have, we, I will we ask have, about deed restrictions. We have before. enforcement mortgages, deed restrictions, land leases, and regulatory agreements. So and, and a history of community organizing. So we we're 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 locked down f for life. My ple my pleasure to meet you. Uh, my luck to meet you. Uh, I will now uh, finally close the public hearing on land use item 347, and it will be laid over. I will ask HPD to continue to bring great uh, nonprofit organizations uh, like they've been building. Our third and final hearing will be on pre-considered land use item 167, West 133rd Street in Councilmember Perkins District in Manhattan. HPD is seeking the termination of the prior exemption for this site and a new 40-year Article 11 tax exemption pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law. The building is a 15-unit low-income co-op, was carved out of the most recent third-party transfer program. Yay! <laughs> Uh, the reason for these yays is there was quite a bit of controversy over uh, home ownership opportunities being lost up due to a third party transfer program that, at least in my belief, was there to take properties back from bad landlords, not bad owners where they own their own units. The 40 year tax exemption will be retroactive for eight years. Yay. This will help get rid of some of the tax burdens uh, that would otherwise have forced uh, these homeowners out of their homes. The current HDFC will retain ownership for this building. Yay. I now open the public hearing on this application. I would like to invite HPD to present its testimony. Before doing so, I will remind uh, one person in particular that they are still under oath. I think. I, I have she hasn't been sworn in yet. She wasn't I'm, sworn in? I'm not under oath. oath. <laughs> oh, wow. I was wrong. You are not still under oath. I've just been... Uh, uh, you, you have been communicating throughout the hearing from the audience, so let that reflect. Uh, so I will ask the uh, council to please swear in both people. She communicated through notes. Yeah. <laughs> Can you please state your name before answering? Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and noth nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Genevieve Michael, I do. Try again. 
Nina Sanchak, I do. Thanks. This pre-considered item consists of an exemption area containing one privately owned, partially occupied building located at 167 West 133rd Street, Block 1918, Lot 7, in Manhattan Council District 9, seeking Article 11 tax benefits. 167 West 133rd Street Housing Development Fund Corporation, HDFC, is a 15-unit low-income co-op which was taken into city ownership in 1978. In December of 2000, the property was conveyed to existing tenants as part of the TIL program. The building was pulled from round 10 TPT through local law 11, uh, local law number 1197. HPD is seeking, HPD is seeking a full Article 11 tax exemption with a 40-year regulatory agreement retroactively applied beginning in 2011 to preserve, pre preserve the building as affordable homeownership. To help stabilize the building, the HDFC used the proceeds from the sale of a vacant apartment in 2018 to pay their DEP arrears in full on 10-19-2018. Other components of the plan include maintenance increases, addressing matters regarding shareholders and arrears, and the sale of four of the five vacant units. The fifth will be a rental. Additionally, the HDFC will modify their original mortgage and execute a new regulatory agreement. Under the proposed terms of the new agreement, the sale of shares for any unit that becomes available will be restricted to households with income at or below 120% AMI. The property contains a mixture of unit types, which includes one studio, nine one bedrooms, four two bedrooms, and one four bedroom apartment. The AMIs for the existing shareholders range from up to 30% of AMI to 60% of AMI, and maintenance charges include $535 for the studio, $750 for a one bedroom unit, $963 for a two bedroom unit, and $1498 for the four bedroom unit. The building has minimal housing code violations and will be addressed uh, through regular maintenance. Therefore, the HDFC is not planning to apply for any rehabilitation loan funding. In, effort, in an effort to maintain continued afford affordability and stability in the building, HPD is before the council seeking Article 11 tax benefits dating back to 2011. The exemption, exemption will be for a term of 40 years that will coincide with the regulatory agreement. The current estimated cost of the tax benefit is $3,121,311 with a net present value of $1,271,545. What is the... Uh What is the retroactive tax burden that is being forgiven? Um, I'll answer that. It is $320,516. What are the AMIs for the current tenants and shareholders of this building, and what are the anticipated AMI targets for future shareholders of this building? Um, so as I said, they range from 30 to 60% of AMI for the current uh, tenants. I think new uh, purchases will be restricted to households with income at or below 120 AMI. What is the AMI for that census tract and the surrounding community? Uh, so I think as we've discussed, I think HPD doesn't actually feel like census tract is the most reliable piece of data, um, given, you know, varying sizes throughout the city, uh, as well as a very large margin of error. Uh, but 64% of residents in the community district, or roughly in the community district, make below 80% of AMI. So just to be clear, that means that uh, these future vacancies will actually be 50% more for people making 50% more than the people in the community. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you are certainly familiar with the TPT program, and I think the goal here is to stabilize the building and ensure the future financial stability and health for the existing tenants so we're not in another, you know, situation where you have uh, arrears or various problems. The, the concern I want to raise is just the current tenants are at 60% of AMI. Is that correct? That's the, the, the ceiling? Uh, yeah, it's between 30 and 60, yeah. So people, if it's a, a sim, single individual, they're making 21000 to 43860 and the new tenants who are going to come in are going to be making, if it's just a single person, 87720 and if it's a family of eight, you've updated the sheet on your website, uh, it would be 165240 uh, And so... Um, I liked it when it was six, but that's fine. <laughs> I didn't realize these things went up to a quarter million dollars a year. I need a, wow, okay. 
Uh, sorry, uh, the quarter million was the 165% to AMI, a family of eight could make $227,205, which, again, does not feel affordable. Uh, so I guess I, I will bring it to the local council member. My concern is that the, uh, the regulatory agreement should preserve at least this, preserve at the minimum preserve the status quo, not have a gentrifying impact on the community hear the concern, but again, I think HPD's focus here is providing stability to the building, um, and this is the best way we think to do that. Uh, what is the anticipated sales price for vacant units? Um, it is uh, 100000 for the one bedroom and 180000 for the two bedrooms, the three two bedrooms. And how many vacant units? Uh, there are five in total. Uh, four are going to go up on the market for sale, and one of them, the co-op, is hoping to rent out before they start the regulatory agreement. Are there any commercial units? No. If somebody would like one of these three home ownership opportunities, how do they apply for one of these three home ownership opportunities? For people who are watching at home, that would mean you are earning $87,720 a year if you're a single individual. If you're a family of eight, you could earn $165,240. Uh, like with uh, the prior projects you saw today, as well as all of HPD's affordable units, uh, they will be available on Housing Connect. Uh, thank you. I th think that uh, resolves my questions on this. I'm generally uh, in favor of uh, preserving our HDFC housing stock. Uh, are there any questions, sorry, is there anyone here from the uh, public who would like to testify? Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on this application. It will be laid over. This concludes today's hearing. I would like to thank the council and land use staff for preparing today's hearing and the members of the public and my colleagues for attending. This meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>